In this lecture, we'll start looking at linked lists in C. While this may be review material for many, we'll present it as new material, though at a quick pace. Even if you've already worked with linked lists, be sure you understand how they work in C by reviewing and understanding the code example and by doing the in-lecture questions. Let's start with the node typedef on lines uh, 4 through 7. It's a simple looking struct. But the next field on line 6 is something special. It's a field of node, but also a pointer to node. So how does that work? And what's that extra struct keyword there for? First, a struct may have fields that are pointers to its own type. Such pointers could point to the very struct of which they're a part, but usually we create several structs of the type, several nodes, and they point to one another, via their respective next fields. Before we start pointing these structs to one another, though, let's look at the special syntax needed for a self-referential pointer like next. We can't use node alone to declare such a pointer, because the type def isn't completed until line 7, and thus can't be used on line 6. But C allows you to set up a tag name for a struct, by adding a name after the struct keyword, as we do on line 4 here. The tag name can be the same as the type def name, or different. It's usually clearer to make it the same. The tag name is instantly usable on the following lines, but you must repeat the struct keyword to use the tag name. That's why we added the struct keyword on line 6. We're using the tag name there, not the as yet unfinished type def. Now, once we have the type def finished, it's more convenient than the tag name, since we don't have to repeat struct over and over. So just about the only time a struct tag name is used is for self-referential fields, those that point to the same struct type of which they are a field. Now, adding a node pointer field to node itself lets us set up chains of these structs, as I show here in the diagram each struct's next pointer points to the next struct in the chain. The final next pointer contains null. Typically, we have a single pointer, not a struct, like head on line 42 down in the code here, to point to the first struct. And then the chain continues from there. Now, this pattern is called a linked list. The initial pointer is called the head pointer. And each struct in the list is called a node. Thus, the names head and node in the code. Why set up such an arrangement? Because each node, aside from pointing to the next, also carries some data. In our simple example, that's just an int field called, appropriately enough, data. In a working program, however, there might be quite a number of data fields in each node. For instance, uh, each node might carry an entire body of information about a student in some university registration system, or uh, another linked list in the same system might carry a bunch of fields describing information about a course. So the data fields outnumber the next fields quite, uh, quite a bit. We already have a way to hold such sets of information, of course, arrays. In using the concepts from the earlier lecture, we can even choose the size of the array while the program runs. But even with dynamic allocation, once an array or memory block has been created, its size may not be changed. If we run out of space in the block and we wish it were bigger, there's no recourse but to create another larger block, copy the smaller one into it, discard the smaller one, a time-consuming task. It's tempting to think that one might simply ask mALloc or a related function to extend an existing block by a few more elements, but this assumes that the runtime heap space immediately after a block is available and not reserved. And this is rarely so, and so we cannot reliably increase the size of an already allocated block. There is, however, by the way, a C library function realloc that appears to cre increase a block size, but usually it has to do the copy into a bigger block approach that uh, was just described here. So coming back to linked lists here, 
What can we do if we want to store a set of, say, student data, and we can't predict how many students we will have? The linked list solves this problem in that it can be extended one node at a time, ad infinitum, by dynamically allocating nodes as needed and then linking them into the existing uh, linked lists. In the following discussion, we'll see just how that works. In our main program, we start with an empty linked list. And then we call add on lines 45 through 47 to add nodes to our list. Before we get into that, though, a brief aside here. We'll walk through the lines of add carefully to explain how this is all done. But first, this critical point. You cannot understand linked lists without drawing diagrams. And you have to draw them correctly, in particular showing an actual box for each pointer, including the head pointer. The diagrams for this lecture are a good example to follow. Every programmer who works with linked lists does such diagramming in effect. Experienced programmers just do it in their head. Until you can confidently diagram linked lists in your head, do it on paper, especially as you answer the in-lecture questions. So let's start with a diagram of an empty list. An empty list has a head pointer, which will be our variable head here again but no nodes, so the head pointer is uh, set to null, as we do on line 42 here, the beginning of main. A null pointer consistently marks the end of a list, whether it's the value of head or the value of next in the last node. And a note again on diagramming, when a pointer contains null, never draw an arrow leading from it some other place there is no place in memory called null. A null pointer simply has no target at all. And please don't even use the phrase points to null. Say is null instead to reinforce the idea that a null pointer has no target. So with that prologue now, the add function up here works by taking an integer to put into the data field of a new node and the current head pointer, which will pass to the parameter old head. It adds a new node to the start of the list and returns a new head pointer value, the address of the added node, which we assign back into head down here in the main. So this, for instance, would add 10 to a node and then the address of that new node would be put back into head. Now, this is, by the way, the first time we've seen a function that we've written that returns a pointer. Typically, or the syntax for doing that is seen here on line uh, 20, uh, or line 9. You add a uh, star ahead of the function name to make it return a pointer, much like adding a star ahead of a variable name makes the variable into a pointer. Typically, such a function sets up a pointer as a local variable, like we do here, and then returns it. On the first call of add, the null in head is copied to parameter old head, um, and this is what we get. Add then initializes local pointer return by calling malloc with a request for enough memory to store one node of the linked list. So, return now points to a new node that we'll add to our list. Line 12 copies the data, which I believe was 10 from our initial call, into the uh, data of our new node. And line 13 copies old head into the next field. And question 1, after line 13, then, where does return arrow next point? It's a bit of a trick question. Coming back from a pause, the answer is it points nowhere. It contains null, copied from old head. This is as it should be, because in this case our new node is the only one on the list, and is thus automatically the last one. The last node on a linked list always has a null pointer. All that's left to do is return RTN so that main can assign it into head. And we'll be left with a configuration that uh, looks like that. Head pointing to the one node on our list. 
But uh, does it work for the next note? Added by the call on, say, line 46 down here. In this case, we already have an existing node, and we need to add the new node ahead of it on the list. The first few lines of add work the same in this case. Let me move this node aside for a moment. We can create a new one. We'll create a new node and uh, then fill its data with the 20 that would be data for the second call from line 46 there. At this point, line 13 has a different effect, though, than last time. If I write RTN arrow next equals old head, on this call, old head would have been copied from head and will be pointing to the existing node on the list. And then we need to ask what RTN arrow next equals old head will do. And I would say RTN arrow next equals old head makes RTN, arrow next, this one here, point to old head, right? Um, no, it doesn't do that. What's wrong with what I just said? Tracking it carefully again, we pass the existing head to old head, so it points to the existing node. We made a new node, and then we said RTN arrow next equals old head. And I am suggesting that that points to the next to old head. It's a very common and critical mistake regarding pointer assignment that I want to point out so you'll avoid it. What should I have said and drawn instead here? Pause and think for a minute. Okay, assigning one pointer into another, say pointer A equals pointer B, does not point pointer A to pointer B. It copies the address in pointer B into pointer A, the address in, say, old head into RTN arrow next, and the result is that they both point to a third separate thing from either pointer. They both point to pointer B's, old heads in this case, target. So what I should have drawn was that. I should have shown that RTN arrow next will now point to the existing node on the list, just like old head does. Avoid slipping into the pattern of thinking in a pointer assignment points one pointer to another. It always points the target, or the left-hand side pointer, to a third separate thing, which is the target of the right-hand side pointer, and they share a target after the assignment. If that seems like simple review, my apologies, but watch out for it. It's a common misconception. Now that we have the diagram correct, we return RTN so that main can assign it into head on line 46 here. And the linked list will then finally have two nodes. And while I'm at it, I got rid of old head and RTN in the diagram because they are just local variables, so they'll be gone. Now, just to be a little bit fancy, line 47 actually adds two new nodes to the list by using the return value of one add call as the second parameter to the next. If that surprises you, note that we can use any expression of the correct type to satisfy a parameter, even a function call's return value. So we can take the result of add 30 head and pass that in to the next call here. And then the question three would be, ending up this lecture segment, uh, what are the nodes looking like? What does the linked list look like? And, and in what order are the nodes after that line 47 call? Pausing and then coming back. The answer is that the first node in the list will have a 40 in it. <clears throat> the innermost add call with a 30 is done first. And the final order of the nodes is then 40, 30, 20, and 10. And there'll be four nodes in the linked list.